Thank you, Franklin. It was in the latter part of the 19th century that Japan was first introduced to the country and peoples of the United States. It was a meeting that, in retrospect, can be seen to have foreshadowed the long and tumultuous relationship that was to come. For the Japanese people, the reaction to first contact with the Americans was, predicate, was predicated on earlier relationships with other European nations. Its first encounters with the West in the 16th and early 17th century for, centuries, for example, resulted in the Japanese government in 1639 mandating an official closure of the country to protect Japan from what was perceived to be the threat of foreign aggression and a potential challenge to the shogun's rule. Europeans were expelled from the country and Japanese people traveling abroad were not allowed to return. The only Western foreigners permitted to stay and trade in Japan were the Dutch, who were confined to a small man-made island off the coast of Nagasaki, where their activity was strictly controlled. For over 200 years, the government almost completely sealed Japan off from the rest of the world. This all changed, however, with the arrival of a fleet of American shipped, com ships commanded by naval officer Commodore Matthew Perry in 1853. Although Japan initially resisted a relationship with America and with the West, when Perry returned a year later in 1854 with the threat of force, he succeeded in opening the country to trade with the United States and eventually with other countries as well. Soon after the treaties with the Western nations were signed, a foreign settlement was established within the port city of Yokohama. Not surprisingly, the presence of exotic-looking foreigners with their unusual hairstyles and exo exotic clothing fueled a Japanese interest in images of the Westerners. Woodblock print publishers in the nearby capital of Edo, soon to be Tokyo, were quick to capitalize on this fascination with the denizens of the foreign settlement and began to issue a new kind of woodblock print known as the Yokohama print. Between the years 1859 and 1861, these prints, which were mass produced for a general audience that could easily afford them, were extremely popular. As you can see here, all the Western inhabitants of Yokohama, the Dutch, the French, the Russians, the English, and the Americans, were represented in these prints. As you can also see, to the Japanese artists who designed these prints, these strangers all looked pretty much the same. <laughs> Other than an occasional costume flourish, the foreigners were distinguishable only when there was text or a printed inscription to, uh, to indicate their nationality. The emphasis was on the exoticism of the subject, the, and specific cultural differences were secondary when they had any relevance at all. Americans, these fair-skinned people of European descent, were a popular subject among the pictures of foreigners in Yokohama. This image of the American, however, was a complicated one. Unlike depictions of the homogeneously perceived peoples of Holland, Russia, France, and England, this image did not represent all of the American people that were coming into the Japanese consciousness. American newspapers, magazines, dime novels, and even scientifically sanctioned geography and history books depicted two other kinds of American people, the Indians and the Negroes, as they were referred to in 19th century parlance. These others came to be known to the Japanese through the filter of stories and illustrations conceived by the white Western world, stories and illustrations that provided a subtext defining non-whites as subhuman. The fact that this message was clearly received is evident in the 19th century Japanese labeling of many images of American Indians and African Americans as America no dojin, or American savages. <laughs> 
the exportation of negative racially stereotyped images had a profound influence on the Japanese, not only in their perception of the American Indian and the African American, a perception which some would argue still exists today, but on their understanding of their own place in the world. Today I would like to explore some of the issues surrounding the exportation of American images of racial stereotypes and the effect that they had on Japanese art and culture. The American of European descent, the white American, was not the first American to be introduced to Japan through art. About 300 years earlier, in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, Dutch maps, which were widely disseminated throughout the world, propagated images of American Indians who were depicted, and I have to say correctly depicted, uh, in these quasi-scientific illustrations of the people of different nations as the representative culture of America. Through these maps, Dutch cartographers established the conventions for portraying the peoples of the world, people with whom the Japanese had no experience and about whom they had no visual knowledge. These conventions were then copied and codified by Japanese artists in the early 17th century in large paintings made for a wealthy military class interested in exotic themes. This is a, a pair of eight panel folding screens. On the left screen, we see a depiction of the 28 cities of Western cities derived from maps by Dutch matchmaker, map maker Willem Blau. Above the cities, eight rulers of the Christian and Muslim worlds face off in pairs. On the right screen, there is a map of the world flanked on either side by 42 pairs of costumed figures representing the peoples of the world. These people are organized following the Dutch model with what some scholars have called the conquerors on the right and the conquered on the left. And while care seems to have been taken to distinguish the different nationalities and present them in an unbiased, almost anthropological way, there is no denying that the painting presents an iconography of civilized versus uncivilized, with the grouping of white and light-skinned on the right and non-white on the left, the richly clothed on the right and the partially clothed on the left, the weapon as fashion accessory on the right and the weapon in hand as weapon on the left. This image not only had a powerful effect on the Japanese perception of the people of the world, but caused them to think self-reflexively about their place in this global stratification. In many of these paintings, they appear at the bottom of the white skin side and white skin side, and as historian Ronald Toby has discussed, in this painting, the artist has given the Japanese woman an atypical curly hairstyle in an attempt to make her look like a Renaissance beauty. This is an important thing to notice because in the mid-19th century, this same placement within the hierarchy would be clearly defined by American geographers and widely accepted by the Japanese people. There was probably a vague sense of this image of the American Indian in, the, in 19th century Japan. Despite the strictness of self-imposed isolation that had begun in the early 17th century, by the early 18th century, the government had relaxed some of the laws regarding contact with the Dutch. Books were allowed to be purchased and translated. Rangaku, or Dutch learning, became fashionable. And because of the extremely high literacy rate in Japan, upwards of 80%, there was a ready market for the publication of thousands of copies of these translated Dutch volumes. Dutch cartography, perpetuating the visual images of the people of the world, was once again studied as, an inter as interest in the West grew. Generally speaking, though, the image of the American Indian placed among the many uncivilized peoples on these maps was rather benign. They were really one group of the many scantily clad, brown-skinned brown -skinned people wearing feathered, hairdress, feathered headdresses that inhabited the Americas. It was not until the 19th century and interaction with the people of the United States of America that this image began to change from this rather impersonal anthropological representation of earlier periods into something that was more savage and threatening. In reality, the image of the American Indian that came to Japan in the mid-19th century took a variety of forms. 
the relationship between Native Americans and white Americans in the United States was in flux, and this was reflected in contemporary newspapers that contained everything from articles on the noble savage that featured culturally edifying engravings of what was perceived of as controlled life on the plains to cartoons of savages brandishing knives. The Indian as savage and sexually threatening also appeared in rather lurid images in imported publications like Beatles' dime novels. The most significant and influentially far-reaching choice of which image was the accurate one seems to have been made in Japan by the renowned scholar Fukuzawa Yukichi, who not only made two trips to America, but was a leading figure in a zealous attempt by a new imperial Japanese government that came to power in 1868 to undertake the modernization, or what might, might realistically be called the westernization of Japan. As we can see from these woodblock prints, one of the most popular form of media of the day, Pictures showing technological innovations like the steam train and the emperor wearing modern Western dress was one means of visually educating the public to move toward what was referred to at the time as civilization and enlightenment. The writings of Fukuzawa, a scholar who had actually traveled to the West, was another. He was an influential figure who wrote prolifically on the subject of civilization in regard to the people of Japan. But his ideas were not so much based on personal experience in the West as they were on information coming from illustrated American geography books, like Samuel Augustus Mitchell's A System of Modern Geography, which he translated and interpreted for a Japanese audience. It was Mitchell, and consequently Fukuzawa's theory, that the people of the world fell into three categories, the civilized, the uncivilized, and the semi-civilized. Not surprisingly, the Europeans and Americans of European descent were placed in the civilized category. American Indians and Africans were placed in the uncivilized category. The Japanese people fell into the semi-civilized category. Undaunted by this designation, Fukuzawa wrote that this should make the people of Japan strive to become civilized, hence providing the rationale for westernization in the guise of modernization. Part of the effort toward modernization in the mid-19th century was the transformation of the Japanese educational system. In 1872, new modern textbooks were required, and Fukuzawa's book, Nations of the World, an abridged translation and adaption of several geography and history books published in the United States, became an officially mandated textbook for Japanese schools. First published in 1869 as a book for both adults and children, it had had several reprintings and overall had sold over a million copies it greatly influenced how Japanese people viewed the Western world. Consequently, the Japanese concept of the American Indian was greatly influenced by Fukuzawa's discussion and illustrations of North America in nations of the world. This is the illustration for his passage on the American Indian. The caption within the frame of the illustration explains it in a nutshell the savages of America clubbing European people to death. Drawn from the American geography and history books he used as his source material, it was an image that sociologically and, scientific, was socio sociologically and scientifically sanctioned by the Western authors he held in such high regard. But authors like Goodrich, Sears, and Barber, whose illustrations we see here, were not traveling across America to sketch true-to-life true depictions of the American Indian. They, too, were drawing from an earlier visual source, a powerful image found in the first American history painting to be accepted by the Paris Salon, the 1804 painting of the murder of Jane McCrae by the American artist John Vanderlyn. It was a pictorial convention so pervasive that it was the model on which illustrated articles, books, cartoons, advertisements, and dime novel covers were derived. Although the painting itself did not create the initial excitement the artist had hoped for in Paris, 
it indirectly began the codification of the image of the American Indian that would, in a variety of permutations, transcend its time and place. The theme of the painting is a young American woman being scalped by savage Indians in the employ of the British Army during the Revolutionary War. It was an illustration of a story based on true events that took place in 1777, but continued to capture the imagination of the American public well into the early 20th century. Many versions of this Vanderlyn painting continue to be engraved, painted, lithographed, and, and lithographed well into the early 20th century. I show you two examples here, an early version done by inventor-painter Robert Fulton of steamship fame, and one done by Courier and Ives in 1846. It was from illustrations like these, heavily influenced by the convention established by Vanderlyn, that Fukuzawa has derived his image of the American Indian. That this particular representation of the American Indian became part of the Japanese consciousness is clearly expressed in both his 1879 woodblock and this both in this 1879 woodblock print by the artist Adachi Ginko and the kabuki play on which this print is based. It is an illustration of the play The Strange Tale of the Castaways, a Western Kabuki, produced in 1879 by the celebrated theater owner Morita Kanya and the famous playwright Kawatake Mokuami. Fresh from a highly acclaimed performance of a play in honor of and attended by General Ulysses S. Grant two months earlier, they were hoping to capitalize on the publicity and their celebrity by writing and bringing to the stage a play about Japanese people traveling through America and Europe. In this illustration of the beginning of Act Two, we see the dangerous desert plains of America. There has been a train crash which has left these young Japanese travelers in Western dress victim to the sexual and barbarous nature of these bright red barefoot and feather adorned American savages as they are described in the cartouches within the composition. We sense the terror that Japanese audiences must have felt before each of these travelers is individually saved by white Europeans and taken to France. It is an image also captured in the author's sketch of the scene and in, in the illustration in the theater program. Both Morita Kanya, uh, both Morita Kanya and Kawatake Mokuami, who wrote and produced this play, were interested in total authenticity. They had signed on wholeheartedly to help the government educate the public about becoming civilized and enlightened. Based on, based on very visible American prototypes, to them and to the people of Japan, this had become the true authentic image of the American Indian. This play of the strange tale of the castaways and its related works of art hint at the image that was being cultivated in Japan of the third type of American coming into the Japanese consciousness, what was referred to at the time as the American Negro. Morita Kanya had the idea of having a play within a play in the last act of his production in which real Western musicians would perform for both the characters in the play and the audience watching the play. There was singing, violin playing, a performance of the Highland Fling, and a comic number from the American minstrel show staple, Bretta Bones. As Vanderlyn's representation of the Indian as savage killer became the convention for portraying the American Indian, so too did this figure with the dull gray colored face and exaggerated features become the convention for portraying the American Negro in 19th century Japan. The black-faced minstrel was an image exported, exported from the United States in a variety of media. The figure on the right is that of Bretta Bones, and while this may not have been Ginkgo's exact model, it is clear he is working from a standardized image for this character. The minstrel show had been, in, had been known to the Japanese as early as 1854 through illustrations like these watercolors depicting the events surrounding Commodore Perry's arrival in Japan. These are paintings of the minstrel show that followed a banquet given by Perry for Japanese guests in 1854. 
It was performed by some of his crew members who blacked up their faces to do songs, a show which delighted the Japanese audience. Black people and images of black people were not new to Japan in the mid-19th century. They too had appeared on Dutch maps and Japanese interpretations of these maps in the uncivilized category. And yet contemporary records suggest that there was a certain reverence for the Africans that came to Japan in the late 16th century as both crewmen and slaves of the European traders. Many Japanese people thought their dark skin indicated that they were from India, the land of Buddha's birth, and they came from miles around, sometimes even breaking down the doors of residences to see them. In early 17th century, paintings of the port of Nagasaki showing Portuguese traders and clergy members with their, who? Sorry. With their Javanese and African slaves, um, there is only a slight difference in appearance between the slaves and their masters. The skin and hair color is not the same, and the slaves are barefoot. Otherwise, there is little differentiation in their features and form. They were all strange and exotic uh, foreigners. They were, and this was what was important at the time, not Japanese. Gradually, however, the subhuman treatment of these slaves by the white Europeans with whom the Japanese identified caused the Japanese to feel that they should despise them and treat them as inferiors. In the Yokohama prints made in the early 1860s, there are two approaches to portraying black people. In works by artists like Utagawa Sadahide, we find a similar approach to painting people of color as was seen in er the early 17th century paintings of the Portuguese at Nagasaki. In this woodblock print of a salesroom of a foreign mercantile, ex mercantile firm in Yokohama, for example, we see what is described in the cartouche to the right, a black laundress. Except for the grayish coloring of her skin, however, she looks very similar to the white women in the room. She is the only woman, though, with a cartouche explaining her identity. Perhaps it is because she is so similar that she had to be identified as different. This sensitive approach to the subject is very different from portrayals of the black American men we see in Yokohama prints. This is one. It is a depiction of dark-skinned, half-naked and barefoot American black men. And despite being served by a white woman, they are the very image of the definition of uncivilized in appearance. The cartouche that tells us that these are, black, uh, that these are American black men does not contain the word gin or person, the term used for depictions of white men, but the term beau, which at the time was a derogatory term used for brown-skinned servants from other countries. It is the equivalent of the word boy. The artist here appears to have used scenes from paintings of the documentation of Perry and his crew as his source. Here we see both a seated black American sailor with his naked torso and claw-like fingernails and a standing member of Perry's crew with the same defined muscles of the men seen in the woodblock print made about six years later. This figure has the same loose pants and even holds a scarf which seems to be an attribute, attribute in common with the later figures. In all three compositions, the clothing with the scarf worn by the figure in the foreground and the definition of their nude muscular bodies are reminiscent of the paintings and sculptures of Buddhist demons turned guardians who are threatening in their fierce protection of the Buddhist law. The appropriation of this form in both the 1854 hand scroll and this print of 1860 further emphasize the uncivilized, possibly hidden demonic nature of the black race, known to, on, known to the majority of the 19th century Japanese population only through pictures like these. The long and tumultuous relationship between Japan and the United States that began with Perry's trips in the mid-19th century forced the Japanese to see themselves as part of a global community for the first time in over 200 years.
In closing, let me say that as we continue to explore the impact of America on Japan in the 19th century and even into the 20th century, it is important to acknowledge the power of American artistic conventions of race that not only shape the Japanese perception of the West, but challenge their very identity. Thank you.